welcome back. Thank you. Um, as I said, that we are observing press club rules here, and in part that is uh, because we are streaming this conversation in the the. It's, it's difficult for people who are not here to have lots of different microphones. So, so it's partly for technical reasons. So if you have questions or comments, you're all adults, at least you seem to be adults. Don't feel you need to ask a fake question just to be in it. If you want to say something, just pass a card to the, uh, where are the people who are collecting the cards? Where are they? So that I know where they are. Just so somebody will, by magic, we will get those cards. So thank you all for rejoining us. Thank you for staying with us so far. We are so delighted to, to join our panel. Of course, you've met Professor Miles and you met Paul Chat Smith. And joining us now, Kevin Gover, a member of the Pawnee Nation, who's director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, a position he's held since 2007, where he's guided the museum through the opening of uh, a number of critically acclaimed exhibitions and initiatives. Uh, you may also, those of you who cover follow politics may remember that he previously served as Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs in the Department of the Interior under President Bill Clinton. And uh, you may also remember that his tenure is perhaps best known for his apology to Native American people for the historical conduct of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Please welcome or welcome home, Kevin Gover, thank you for coming downstairs to join us. <laughs> We're also delighted to have here Lonnie Bunch III, historian, author, curator, educator, the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in just the year, that little over a year, that the museum has been open. 17 months. 17 months. It has broken all kinds of records for attendance. Um, you even have a stamp now, a stamp. <laughs> Uh, he previously served as president of the Chicago Historical Society, uh, the, in, in, in a, in a, an associate director at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. He served at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum and curator of history for the California African American Museum in Los Angeles. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have read his many writings. I, don't, I think he does those in his sleep. I don't know how else, and he served on a number of boards, and his many honors and awards include election as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Lonnie Bunch, thank you so thank much you. for joining us as well. Thank you. So let me start, let me start. You know, it's, it's interesting, because as, um, you know, as a journalist, a lot of times when you, know, you ask people a hard question, you know, particularly, I'll just say it, liberals, will often say, it's complicated. And then that's supposed to end the conversation. But everybody up here, part of their, your business is complicating narratives. So let me start with you, Lonnie Bunch, and say why. I think in some ways, the most important thing places like museums can do is to help the public embrace ambiguity. We are in a place where people are too busy looking for simple answers for complex questions. And by looking through, the, through history, by crafting exhibitions, publications, tell people to understand that the answers aren't simple, that there's a lot of nuance and shades of gray. And what you want is people who become comfortable dealing with uncertainty, with change. And so for me, ultimately, the job of a good museum is not just to have good exhibitions or wonderful collections. It's really to change a country. And I think the best way to change a country is to help people embrace ambiguity. Paul and Ty, thank you. I'm going to skip past you because we've had a chance to hear from you. Kevin Gover, why? Why make people uncomfortable? These people have to pass appropriations and give donations and come to galas. Yeah, well, why are you going to make them uncomfortable? I think it, it, it should matter that, um, that, that what, we, what we say in the narratives that we present are true. And uh, if, we, if the narrative were simple, then we would not be being truthful about, about history, mostly, that mangy dog Paul kept talking about. Um, I, you know, I've, I've always agreed with Lonnie from the moment I arrived at the Smithsonian about what the work of these museums really is. It's nice, to, I don't think I've ever heard him say before that we're out to change the country. That was certainly my attitude from the moment I arrived, that from this platform, uh, we have an extraordinary opportunity to teach history in a very different way than it's been taught in the past. And uh, the start of that, I think, 
is to say, um, yeah, it is. It's really messy. It's complicated. It's not easy to understand. It's not just good guys and bad guys. And so for us to do something like uh, say, you know, um, the Trail of Tears wasn't just about Andrew Jackson is, uh, is, is really quite a bold thing for a Native American museum to do. And yet to us, it's, it just seems so, so bloody obvious that, um, that we have no option. So we have no choice but to, but to make it a, ambiguous. Well, people have exercised other choices throughout history, have they not? <laughs> I mean, and uh, I think Paul Chad Smith very uh, ably described the, um, the kind of willful amnesia that we have, many of us have all been taught. So why don't I go back to Professor Miles and ask you, if you don't mind my asking sort of a, in a personal way, when did you start to discover this complicated story, particularly about the relationships between African Americans and Native Americans? And, and, and I am curious about, as a person who is kind of deeply grounded in your own story, did it, did it, what, did it what effect did it have on you? What effect do you want it to have on us? Well, I think my road toward complexity uh, was long and um, full of a number of disappointments. So I'm one of those people who, growing up, um, was told family stories about Native American ancestry. And the stories never went you know, uh, very far beyond um, a surface understanding of, of some great, great being Native. It was never really specific. And for me, it was sort of just a, a background context in my life. I really identified as African American, and uh, in college, I was very focused on um, black history, black literature, black culture, black politics, and any notion that I had about Native America was in this misty place in the back of my head, you know, my grandmother's stories, which had no kind of anchor. And um, in college, I had the opportunity to actually get to know um, some Native people, Native people today. Um, in the present, also fighting against um, various forms of injustice. And once I realized the, the force and the strength and um, the ongoing nature of that narrative, I knew I had to add complexity to what it was that I felt. I mean, what, I, what I had experienced previously was just, um, it was an amorphous idea. It was, it was positive. Um, but it was never interrogated. Um, it was never kind of put, put, put up to any kind of uh, test. And I think that that's, that's a problem. It means that as a black person, I was actually uh, allowing Native people to, be, um, to, to not be fully realized in my own understanding. Paul, what about you? Um, I was very moved by your call for moral responsibility. I mean, that is something that I think you know, a lot of us think about, um, but I was interested in, it, can you describe kind of what led you to that place and conclusion? Well, I've, I've been fortunate in, in terms of my career as a writer and then curator is to have the, the luxury to be using those uh, vehicles as a way to figure out what I think. So I'm just sort of by nature skeptical and question a lot of things. Um, and, re and really want to try to make sense of, of whatever it is I'm looking at. Um, so, so I, I don't know, for the, for the work here, it's about trying to understand who the public is, trying to understand, it, really it's being like this lion tamer where the lion is complexity and trying to figure out how that gets addressed in a way that's compelling, even fun, you know, at times, um, that's, you know, that's really hard. It is hard, but it's also because people like their, they like, well, this is, you know, in journalism, sometimes we say people don't want the facts, they like their story better. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm interested in what reaction that you have gotten as you delve deeper into this work where you had to implicate some people's stories about themselves in ways that they might not have liked. Well, one thing we did with this show, the, the, the biggest single concern was how do you do a show that's going to at first look like it's about stereotypes, it's about cultural appropriation, that it's going to be basically an accusation to our visitors that are mostly white Americans. Uh, and so we actually did formative testing to figure out how to do that. 
because our, our thought is that we need to really engage our public, make them feel a part of it. The biggest, the biggest challenge the museum has always faced is most people come in and feel they have nothing to do with Indians. How do we change that? And, and even when it's exhibits that are very strong about showing um, particular communities' culture and history, it had the effect of it being cultural tourism. It doesn't have to do with you. So the challenge was how do we say, actually, you are a part of this. You are part of it as an American. This is actually a birthright, that you have a way to be connected to American Indians. I always saw it as a kind of emotional jujitsu. How can we take this thing that's ridiculous in many ways, a lot of us have considered oppressive, how do we make that by people seeing they're connected to it into something powerful that can leverage into, well, then how am I connected with this? What are the stories behind it? Why, why is this idea of Indians everywhere so compelling throughout, throughout American history? Could, let, let's, if we could stay on this for a minute, and then I'm gonna get to some of the questions which are quite rich um, from our, um, our friends here. Uh, the, the whole question of getting people to want to talk about it is so interesting to me. I think partly because we're in the same you know, world, which is that you know, nobody's under subpoena to listen to me. You know what I mean? I can't force people to want to hear things that I think they would like to, or would benefit from hearing but don't want to. Um, last month, the nonprofit Quarterly observed that when we covered the opening of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016, we noted the challenges of creating a visitor experience that is both appealing slash enjoyable and true to the narratives that need to be aired. The same challenges certainly apply for the Museum of the American Indian. So I'm going to ask both Lonnie and Kevin to, to reflect on that for a minute. I mean, is the trick of it to make people want to, to talk about these hard things. You know, I don't think it's as hard as everybody says. Mm -hmm. I mean, we framed it, it's, it's really how you frame it, okay? We framed the museum to say that this is not a museum about black people by black people. That in essence, it's a museum that says the story of black America is bigger than any one community and that it profoundly shapes us all. And so we actually thought about what are the things you do that allow people to see themselves in the story? Um, and whether it is progressives who were involved in the civil rights movement who suddenly bring back memories of SNCC in 1964. But what we realized is after doing years of surveys, people wanted a place that would allow them to grapple with the questions they were afraid to ask, that would allow them to find not truths, but maybe some understanding. Um, and so that's how we frame the museum. And what we've been quite taken by is how people are willing to grapple with these difficult issues. The fact that people spend five or six hours in the museum rather than an hour and a half tells me that people, it's not just the crowds because you can't get through, but it's also that they're grappling with questions about cultural appropriation in music or the impact of slavery on the American economy and American culture. So for us, it's first of all recognizing that let's give our audience credit, that they're, that they're more willing to do this, but also let's make sure they understand that it's a museum that commemorates, not simply celebrates. And the Smithsonian is a place that traditionally celebrates. So we have to begin to help people see it through different lenses. Kevin? I guess I think that you know, our audiences self-select. The people who come to the museum, are, you know, they choose to be here, as you were saying. And so it's likely that the people who most need what we have to say are the least likely to come here. And so I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure, in fact, I, I'm sure we're not having the conversation with, um, with the people that we most need to persuade. On the other hand, I'm not into wasting a lot of energy trying to persuade people who will never be persuaded. And so I'm more interested in that middle audience. Um, and that's why um, Paul and Cecile's work on Americans was so important was it really was an exercise in trying to figure out how do we communicate with them. It would be easy to tell a Trail of Tears story that appeals to, um, you know, the average liberal who, who wants to come here and feel bad about the way the United States treated Indians. But um, uh, we assume we already have their vote, 
And so um, we're really looking. We're really looking to go beyond that and not just uh, not just appeal to our our most persuadable audience, but find a way to be more persuasive with an audience that really doesn't know um, really doesn't know quite how to feel uh, about all of this. You know, you can't. Um, you know, we talk about it a lot. Uh, we talk about removal, and we can we can credibly prove that these events of the past um, are responsible for much of the poverty in the present. But what we can't do is get uh, a person whose, uh, whose family extends back to the time of removal, a non-Indian person, to say, it benefited me, right? Um, that, that's a tough thing to do. And, and, and I think probably not a necessary thing to do. Uh, I'm not sure about that. but. Um, but we're trying to we're trying to find those people and kind of move them beyond where they've been willing to go in the past. Okay. But what what about the internal conversation with the people who are already relatives? Okay. Why did you want to have this conversation today? I can imagine that there are members of the community who are like, I don't really need to be reminded that Indian people owned slaves because I'm having a hard enough time just being seen. So I don't need to see that laundry aired. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that takes us back to that uh, ambiguity and why ambiguity is necessary. Um, if we tell ourselves happy stories about how people got along uh, at different times and we tell only the happy stories, then that's a lie. And, uh, and any alliances that we formed are not going to be based in reality and not going to be based and not going to survive a difficult time. Because people come together in a time and a place and under particular circumstances in their own interests. And what, much of what Paul and Taya were saying was showing that, that, that um, in the right time, in the right places, the right circumstances, yeah, blacks and Indians came together and, uh, and, and, and did these, these remarkable things. Um, in other circumstances, they did really terrible things to each other. And so uh, um, we're, I guess the point is that we're people and we behave the way people do. Uh, and we shouldn't, we, it, it's foolish for us to pretend that we're something other than that or that that's not the way, you know, our lizard brains work just like everybody else's. Should there be an apology? From? Slave owners to the enslaved. <clears throat> um, from slave owners to the enslaved, you, we're really talking right now, though, about the descendants of slaveholders to the enslaved. Is mm -hmm. that what you mean? Yeah. 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 That's who would have to do it. I think that there's value in apology. I do. I think there's a value in the admission, in, in admission of, uh, of wrong, um, even those deep in the past. Uh, one of the reasons I gave an apology speech at BIA was it occurred to me that no one had ever told me when I was a kid that what happened to Indians was not okay. And that that um, nobody in authority, my parents did, of course, but, but nobody in authority had ever said, and you know, you're a kid, you're absorbing all this information, and then you're thinking, well, there must have been something wrong with, with, with us to have been treated this way. And nobody in authority ever said, no, that, that's not true. And so, you know, for this moment that I had some authority in the government, I wanted to say to all those kids out there, this shouldn't have happened. There, it wasn't about you, it was about the bad things that somebody else did. Hmm. So yes, of course, I think there, there should be apologies. Hmm. Professor Miles, how does the history that you described play out today? <laughs> um, it plays out in very concrete and emotional ways in uh, the nations where the Native people owned African Americans as property. It plays out in um, everyday interactions. It plays out in um, tribal politics. It plays out in um, federal law, and it is not, um, it's not a chapter in the history books that was closed at the end of the Civil War by any means. It has been an ongoing struggle for descendants of enslaved people owned by um, the five, quote, civilized tribes. Not a positive name, one that we should revise, but one that was used for those nations at the time. Uh, it has been a long struggle for descendants of enslaved people owned in those nations to actually be able to attain um, full membership, full recognition, uh, social and political equality within those nations. And that has been a wrong 
that people have experienced to the present day. Were you surprised to be having this conversation here at this museum? No. No, you weren't? <laughs> no, this, this museum um, hasn't opened to this kind of conversation um, for at least a decade. And for that, I have been um, really grateful. I mean, as a researcher, as a teacher, as a mother of uh, children who are biracial, African-American, and Native American, knowing that an institution that is really important to the public face of uh, Native American history, Native American culture, Native American politics, has actually acknowledged that there is this link, there is this tie, is really important. I mean, it tells all those Afro-Native people out there, and Paul, we both know there are many, <laughs> Tells all of those Afro Native people out there that um, that they are part of the larger Native community. Of course, they're part of their own nations, but they're also part of an intertribal community that they are recognized, that they are valued, and that's critical. Paul, what do you see? What do you see in the in the present moment? And part of the reason I'm, I, I ask is that we are also in a historical moment where certain questions that I think some of us thought were settled, it, it turns out that they aren't. Um, about the human, you know, human worth, and um, you know, and so I'm just interested in the kind of reckoning that you called for and spoke about. Do you see that happening? I think it's really kind of terrifying. I, 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 on one hand, it should be wonderful, right? We're, we're museums that deal with history, and to see the country like obsessed with history in this way that's surprising. Um, litigating the Civil War, debating it, you know, in this really vibrant way. Um, it feels like w when you're doing exhibitions that have to be up for years, you're trying to predict the future to some degree. Um, it's moving really fast, so it, it makes it hard to kind of, on one level you wish it was more settled so you could critique it. And then what's happening in the country of, you know, what's a fact and, and d you know, my whole career has been about challenging a master narrative. What's the master narrative anymore? Everything's disputable now. It, it, makes, it, it makes it more difficult. Um, but I guess what I've learned as a curator about big museums is that what visitors, most visitors want to know more about something they already know about and are interested in. And you have some room to move things. And then, this is what it took a long time to learn, and I'm giving it away for free, they want to know how it connects to them. You know. Uh, my boss here, Kevin, often pointed out he's the one that forced us to sit at the welcome desk, and I hate that because I want to talk about visitors from my ivory tower perspective. I don't want to actually <laughs> talk to them. But what do they ask? They say, I'm from Iowa. What do you have connected to Iowa? They don't even, that's not even the right question. That's a question they can think of because they want something. They're not blank slates that want to go learn about something they know nothing about. So you have to establish that connection, and then you have to provide some, as, as Lonnie was saying, so the way that our work can help people negotiate things that they're already interested in, how it relates to them, how are you supposed to feel about it. That, that, that's how I think we can, we can actually be powerful if we figure out that we're doing that versus just presenting information you know, in some ingenuous way. Hmm. But Lonnie, I can you speak think, up? Yeah, but I please. also think it's, it's what Kevin said, earlier, recognizing what a bully pulpit the Smithsonian is recognizing, you know, we've both written op-eds for paper, recognizing what are all the platforms you have that at the very least you help contextualize the world people are grappling with today. You help them, give them tools to understand better why race matters in certain ways, um, how cities are built in certain ways. So for me, it's recognizing that, yes, it's who we serve who comes in the door, and one of the strengths of the Smithsonian is that while most of the people self-select, there's also a group that's just doing the Smithsonian. <laughs> so you get people who come in who don't care about, you know, when I was a kid, my father would take me here and, and we'd go to natural history. I could care little about dinosaurs, but we had to go. And so suddenly I learned to hate dinosaurs. But um, <laughs> I, I think what it means, though, is that you do have a group that you can get that you can't get anywhere else that they won't come to an African-American museum in Detroit or Chicago, but they'll come here. Hmm. And so I think you want to take advantage of that. You want to be respectful of the Smithsonian, but you want to realize that for years, the Smithsonian was a place that looked back not in anger, but in nostalgia. Hmm. And you want to be a place that says, 
that's an important part of looking back, but that's only a part. And maybe the most important part is recognizing that these museums that look back are as much about today and tomorrow as they are about yesterday. Hmm. I have one more question on this before I go to the, the, to the questions from the audience. You, you know, we live in a moment where people want to question fact. I mean, that is a fact. You know, people want to create, you know, alternate facts that, that, that are not, don't comport with what you as knowledge seekers and creators know to be true. And um, I'm thinking about, and those comments have greater facility to move into the culture than they did before. Mm -hmm. For people, people promulgating the view that, you know, uh, black people should be grateful for slavery because they got to come to America for free. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, that, that, yeah, there's a, a, a state. You know, it was getting the cruise was important. <laughs> you know, so, so, so the question then becomes, do you feel you have a different job right now than you perhaps had a year ago, five years ago? Um, well, I think that the technology has changed the way information is conveyed, and it means that we have to grapple with social media, do things that we hadn't done. When we built the museum, we realized we had to be one of the first museums born digital. And what does that mean? Um, and so we really had to figure out how to be much more nimble to respond to history that wasn't accurate or respond to you know, the criticisms that we get that aren't valid. But I think the reality is we're a better institution because we recognize that one, the Smithsonian is a place that people still respect and many people trust. So we don't we want to always leverage that. But two, people are looking for us to answer some of those difficult moments, some of the untruths there. And as long as we're comfortable doing that, I think that's a great service we provide. Let me go to some of the questions, which um, this is one that actually I was thinking about, but this is actually phrased so much better than I was going to. So I'll read this one. It's a, the question is, what purpose does the narrative of the native ancestry of black Americans serve? Is it a function of internalized anti-blackness? Professor Miles, do you want to take that? <laughs> Just um, based on reaction, I have yeah, to know what yeah, you think about yeah. that. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I shared earlier that my grandmother uh, would, would tell me and my cousins and you know, my mother, my aunts, my uncles, stories about her father being half native. And when she told these stories, the, the tribe would change. So she wasn't really sure um, what it was that, that, that um, had been passed down to her in terms of this information. When I was in graduate school, I decided to kind of study this, that is to study the phenomenon of African Americans um, claiming Native American ancestry, Native American kin. And I went back to the, the narratives that I mentioned in my talk, um, the WPA slave narratives, and read for any mentions of Native American ancestry among people who were interviewed, formerly enslaved people who were interviewed. And I found some interesting patterns that African Americans who had recently um, been interviewed in the 1930s, who were children while they were enslaved, talked about Native people and their family line in heroic terms. And my grandmother did the same thing. Uh, she talked about you know, her father having uh, this amazing eyesight. She talked about him you know, living to be over 100 years old. Um, she talked about various kinds of physical attributes of his um, as being almost super hero heroic, kind of superhuman in a sense, that she attributed to this idea of his native ancestry. And that was something that um, I saw across these slave narratives, that references to native kin had to do with claiming um, a sense of strength, um, a strength of the ability to fight back, and especially were connected to people who, who had run away. Mm -hmm. That if somebody had escaped in the family, that person was probably going to be described as um, being native or having native ancestry. So my take on it is that um, for African Americans, especially people um, who were thinking about this two and three generations ago, connections to Native America gave them an opportunity to claim their dignity, to claim these uh, emancipatory traditions. America, in a general context, did not allow black people to do that. Native America, in part because of the stereotypes attached to them, um, the stereotype of being proud, of being free, and so on, did allow them to do that. <laughs> so um, 
it's, it's, <laughs> it's complicated. We can get back <laughs> to, our, to our earlier term. I mean, we, we can be critical of it, and I think we should, that we can also recognize uh, the reasons why many African Americans reached for um, Native American ancestry and connections. Yeah. I don't think it's about anti-blackness, um, but I think it does have to do with, with wanting to, to find a way to be viewed as dignified. Mm. There's, a, there's an interesting, it's a technical question, but it's along those lines, is that could it be true that few African Americans show Native American DNA because only a small number of Native Americans from the northern and eastern regions take the DNA tests? There needs to be a database for comparison. Um, I'm, go I'm going with the Viz test because I, I want Kevin to claim me because honestly, I was going to actually bring my, his picture. My grandfather looks exactly like you. <laughs> and so, so I think we need to get swabbed up later just to be sure. <laughs> Okie dokie. I was, I, I was uh, emailing yesterday with Eduardo mm -hmm. Diaz, the uh, uh, director of the Smithsonian Latino Center, and he read that... Um, uh, in a 1902 census of the Comanche tribe, you'll like this, Paul, 42% were Mexicans. Hmm. And so he says, we're primos now, right? That's right. <laughs> and um, so that kind of stuff's going on all the time, you know? Or either that or I have a really common look. <laughs> either know? that, yeah. yeah. Speak about the limitations of terms that don't recognize the legacy of racial mixing. I'm not sure who, who wishes to take that one. Could you repeat it? It says, please speak about the limitations of terms that don't recognize the legacy of racial mixing. And I'm not quite <laughs> sure how to interpret that. Perhaps, what does that mean? Is that, is that our sort of binary way of yeah. thinking about race right. kind of inhibits us? And it's interesting, that is also an interesting question as we become, as a country, majority minority. Like, how are we gonna talk about that if, you know, 13% of the population is African American, and 15% is Latino, which is another made up term, and then a certain number of terms is Asian, which is another made up term, and that becomes the majority. What's the, what's the terminology? So I don't know, I'm, I mean, as scholars, I bet you've probably thought about this more than the rest of us have. Um, I'm asking you to, it's, it's almost like Wakanda. I'm asking you to imagine the new, a new world <laughs> with much better outfits than any of us have. But, um, that's the new Black Panther movie for those of you who haven't seen it. That's the, that's the world of the Black Panther movie. It, it uh, premieres on February 16th. If you haven't gotten your ticket yet, you can. Is that tomorrow? So, February yeah. 16th, it's tomorrow. yeah, it's premiere. Okay. Get your ticket. Thank you, Michelle. Hashtag so, you know, Black Panther so lit. But, um, <laughs> but what about that? I mean, have you guys thought, have you two thought about that? Like, how are we going to talk about this when we're not minorities anymore? Well, I, I'm, I have a, a project which isn't going very well, but I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to bring back the term half-breed. Um, so, okay. so far, the half-breeds aren't on board yet, but... Oh but I Kevin, mean, have fact, you weighed in on this yet? I'm in just... fact, so, so my mother is, quote, full-blood Comanche, except with some, one of those troublesome Mexican ancestors, which the family worried about, because in fact, there were no genetically pure Comanches since forever because it always, we were built on rape and murder and kidnapping and enslavement basically, so nobody, but anyway, people that were supposedly mostly Comanche. And then um, my dad, a white farm boy from Oklahoma, except somehow we learned 20 years ago, the farm I knew very well growing up was on um, Choctaw land, which I didn't believe until I saw the actual certificate. So she was supposedly one eighth Choctaw. So, but, I, but I, basically I never knew about that or cared about it, so they read as white. So I'm trying to think half-breed might be a way to come back to a different, you know, something that's not so limiting as what we have now. So I, it, it's not going well, Michelle, but it, it is something. You're working you try so new work, things, okay? Like, well, oh, President Obama, you remember that the night of the uh, election, he said a mutt, he called himself a mutt. I don't love that either, I gotta be honest with you. No, Unless it's an you know, acronym for M-U-T-T, -T, which is marvelous, united, you know, something or other. Yeah, I don't, it I'm didn't not, work either. I'm not feeling that either, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I don't wanna I, foreclose. I, I, folks, I, I think we'll sort it out. You know, Indians, uh, we're a mess. We, we, um, <laughs> we're very few, I mean, do you know a full blood? I don't know a full blood. I know people who think they are, yeah, but yeah, I guarantee yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> but it used to be a thing. I mean, it used to be a thing. Yeah. Um, where it, when, when I was growing up there in Oklahoma, 
the full bloods kind of lorded it over us as, as half breeds. Um, but that went away. It just went away because, you know, first of all, it was stupid. And second, there are no full bloods anymore um, because we're all intermarried with this and that. Um, you know, and, and so, but we sort it out. Um, you know, in my case, I'm more white than I am Pawnee, but I'm Pawnee. You know, that's who I am. That's what I am. That's my identity. Um, and I think, you know, people of, uh, of mixed race will sort it out. And it's going to be, I mean, there's so much self-determination in that, in deciding this is who I am, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and here's the basis of my claim. <clears throat> now, it doesn't mean Elizabeth Warren can, can claim to be Cherokee without consequence, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, because there has to be a lot of truth to, to what you're claiming. But we get to do that. We get to decide who we are. And um, so I, I, I actually don't worry much about that. Mm -hmm. um, I worry more about trying to uh, put us in boxes and trying to calculate you know, that 13.1% of this or that. Um, I, I think that's, that's a waste of time because we, um, we form an identity you know, as, as we go through life, and, and that's what you are. And, and I don't think, uh, I don't think there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of, once that is done, I don't think there's a lot of ambiguity to it, actually. Hmm. I have two more questions, and then I want to give each of you a chance to give us kind of a closing thought, um, um, a charge, something that we can chew on as we move forward. And the last two questions are, I think this might be for you, Professor Mars. what are the implications of the Cherokee Freedmen decision or the decision to recognize freedmen as Cherokee citizens? And the question is, what are the implications of that? Mm -hmm. Well, this is referring to a federal court decision from um, just this past summer, which recognized the sentence of enslaved people in the Cherokee Nation as um, full members of the Cherokee Nation. And the Cherokee Nation has accepted this and said that they won't, um, they won't fight it. Um, on the one hand, this is a victory. It's a victory for descendants of enslaved people who have been fighting um, ever since, you know, really the aftermath of the Civil War for full inclusion, full recognition of their humanity and of their Cherokee-ness, which is not just about blood quantum. It's also about history. It's also about cultural connections. It's also about um, kinship that might not be, um, um, can be formulated through blood, but it's formulated through adoption or other kinds of very close ties. So uh, it's a tremendous victory in that regard. But it's also, um, it's, it's a, from, in my view, it's a mixed, um, a mixed outcome. Because I wish it hadn't taken uh, a US federal court to enforce this. I wish the Cherokee Nation had taken it upon itself to make the right decision about its moral responsibility to the people who uh, are the progeny of those that the nation enslaved. I wish that um, a colonizing nation, the US, didn't have the power to enforce its will on Native nations. I, mean, I think in a better world, um, the Cherokee Nation would have done the right thing. And if it couldn't have, there would have been um, an international court that heard the case. Hmm, interesting. Well, thank you. So we're down to our last couple of minutes. The, the last question here, which is I think perhaps um, this has really been, it's a question, but this has perhaps been the subject of our conversation, was we each have our own truth. Can we each accept each other's truths? Um, for me, as a journalist, the answer is no, because some truths are not truths. Um, and uh, this is the continual challenge that I think that those of us have who wish to live in the world of fact. And um, I understand that this question is meant in a generous spirit, but um, I would just simply say that um, I thank all of you for your work in creating knowledge and adding to the storehouse of our knowledge. And uh, I am uh, enriched immeasurably by your work. And I think all of us are here too. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for that. Now you've already gotten my assignment, which is before you leave here, introduce yourself to someone you don't already know. Um, and we will start with closing thoughts. I'm gonna start at this end. And Kevin, because this is your house, I'm gonna give you the final word. So Lonnie Bunch, will you please give us a closing thought, just something you would wish us to be thinking about. I think the importance of this conversation, especially about finding common ground, is to recognize that just because you're an outsider doesn't mean you're going to find common ground. 
and that even though you hope to find allies to struggle against an America that we want to see America ultimately become, the reality is that until you deconstruct what it means to be African American, Native American, um, only then can you begin to find the answers that'll get you to a common point of view. Ultimately, I would argue that if you could do one thing for me is help people embrace ambiguity, help people understand that do not fall for the simple answers for complex questions because because many people have and we are where we are because of that. That's Lonnie Bunch the third, the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. So my show is open every day from 10 to 5.30. <laughs> it's on the third floor, and it has the most awesome couches of any museum on the mall. They're manufactured, I think, at a BMW plant in Germany. They're extremely special and extremely comfortable. Okay. So every day but Christmas, we're open. <laughs> Did you want to plug the gift shop, too, while we're <laughs> kind of? Not really. Okay. That's Paul Schott Smith, Associate Curator, the National Museum of the American Indian. Thank you. <laughs> Professor <Mark. laughs> Um A lot of what we discussed today is upsetting. I mean, uh, Paul just laid it on the line and, and, and put it out there um, very bluntly. This history is um, full of a number of uh, moments and behaviors that I almost want to call betrayals, but they're not even betrayals because uh, black people, native people weren't necessarily allies to, to begin with. Um, but I want to try to turn this into a positive direction and say that if we are to actually move out of those silos that um, Tara Hauska uh, really called us to do in, in the comments read by Michelle earlier, we need to recognize what went wrong in the past and try to learn what we can do differently right now because we are in another one of these dire moments and we need to get our acts together. <laughs> Professor Taya Miles, University of Michigan, thank you for being here. <laughs> Kevin, thank you for hosting us today and thank you for allowing us to be in this beautiful space to have this important conversation. What are your final thoughts? Yeah, and thank, thank all of you for coming. It's really um, uh, makes us happy to see so many good people here um, uh, listening to this, especially sitting through one of Paul's uh, lectures. You know. <laughs> um, boy, I had a couple of things rolling through my head, and one of them left, so I'll go with this one. Um, I keep thinking about uh, Sly and the Family Stone and how much I liked uh, everyday people. What brings people together um, in a time like this is a common enemy. And uh, one thing uh, African Americans and Native Americans have always had in common is the is the um, is racism. We, we that's our enemy, um, and uh, and that will probably it, it probably is the most binding uh, force that that um, helps us to see our our commonality right now, and and unfortunately I, I expect that to continue for quite a while, um, and that's you know that's uh, on the one hand it's sad. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's good to have uh, it's good to have an ally <laughs> in in a fight like this, and and not just African Americans and Native Americans, but all people of color, all people who have some um, history of being oppressed um, by by the dominant society in the country, and that uh, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't leave without noting that that's that's extraordinarily powerful, and that uh, that the U.S. is on its way to being. Um, uh, Majority minority or minority majority. I can't remember how we say it. Um, but to being um, uh, increasingly uh, diverse. I think that much of the reaction we're seeing now um, from, a, from, from an element of the white community is actually a fear that when people of color hold more power, hold more power they will abuse it in the same fashion as white people have in the past. And um, I think they should be worried about that. <laughs> be and I say that be because we're no better than they are, right? 
And so we're just as likely to abuse any authority uh, that we gain as, as uh, these people in the past. And um, uh, we, must, uh, we must work on ourselves uh, in order to um, be able to convince that, that that will not be the case. Um, and that's no small thing. We all, we all have grown up. We all have um, spent our lives being taught certain things about each other and about people who aren't like us. And it is, it is hard work to scrub that out of your mind. To not be a racist is really hard because there are so many forces in, in the popular culture and in our educational system that would lead us to be racist. We all have our own stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Um, you know, and, um, and we all somewhere along, you know, in, in there, back in that little lizard brain of ours, have this master race narrative of our own. And, um, and, and we have to pull that out and stomp it to death. So, um, so bottom line, what can you do for us? Don't be a racist, all right? Just, <laughs> and uh, that, goes, that goes for all of us. And, um, and don't, don't think that that's a simple commitment to make. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Mingo. That was great. <laughs>